Okay, guys, we're moving on to question four now, okay? This question is focused very much on sequences and series. Importantly, a sequence is separated by semicolons, right? The terms are separated by semicolons. A series, the terms are added together, right, with an addition sign. So let's just quickly read the question. I made a couple of notes for us, so let's see what they're asking us. It says a pentagon is created using candles as shown in the diagram below. Okay, so we see here that this is one pentagon. Pentagon means five sides, and there are five candles. Okay, then it says by adding more candles, a row of, of two pentagons is formed, right? So I've counted each of the sides and used a little dash to make sure I don't double count, right? Because if you double count, you might actually get to the wrong conclusion when it comes to a general rule. So there's nine candles here. Then they said continuing to add candles, right? These sort of broken birthday candles, it looks like. Um, a row of three pentagons can be formed, right? You see that, yeah? I've counted the number of different um, candles, right, that we have in here, and there's 13. So, notably, we see that it's increasing by four with each term, right? So, what you should automatically be thinking is you should be thinking arithmetic, right? And we know that we have two arithmetic formulas that we can use. This is to find the term, this is to find the sum, okay? And you might be thinking, okay, well, how do you know it's arithmetic? Well, it is the property of the arithmetic sequence, right? It goes up, it has a constant difference. So it doesn't necessarily have to go up, but it has a constant difference between sequential terms. Then we have sequential means coming after each other, okay? So nine comes after five. Then you have a quadratic sequence, which means it has a constant second difference, right? That's its particular characteristic. And then we have a geometric series, which has a constant ratio. And I'm sure we'll see an example of that later on in this question. But this question that we're looking at here is arithmetic, okay? So let's just jump into the question and into the question and see what they want from us. It says, if this pattern continues, what is the maximum number of pentagons that can be formed in a row if a total of 100 candles are available? Okay, so they're asking us about the term, right? So this, remember, is term one, this is term two, and this is term three, okay? Um, so let me just make sure you can see what I'm doing. Okay, cool. So we know that A is our first term, right? So A is the same as T1, okay, which is five candles. We know that D is our constant difference, which is plus four in this instance. And N is what we're trying to work out. So let's use this formula because we're not trying to find the sum, right? We're trying to find the term. That's always important, like what I said in finance. It's always important to define what you want because it will help you know which formula to use. Okay, if you're hearing lots of wind, I think it's about to start raining outside, but I hope you can hear me. Okay, so we're going to say Tn equals A plus N minus 1D. Okay, so I've literally just taken that off the formula sheet. Nothing, nothing too difficult here yet. Um, literally just said, okay, I'm trying to find the term and I'm going to use this one. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute, right, each of my inputs into this without knowing N, obviously, because that is what we're trying to solve. Okay, um, so D we said is 4. But we know that T, Tn equals 100, Okay, that is the number of candles that, or that whole term has 100 candles, right? But N is this number of the term, right? And it might be a little bit confusing because the term, this doesn't equal like 3, right? Or 4 or anything like that, but N can equal 3 or 4. So it's important to distinguish between the value of the term and the number of the term. Here, the value of the term is 5, but it's the first term. Here, the value of the term is 9 but it's the second term. Here, the value of the term is 100, but we're trying to find out what number it is. Okay, it's an, an important sort of, it's quite nuanced, but it's important to um, like sort of twig that in your brain because it took me a little while to um, understand that the first time I learned this, but I think it's a useful one to remember. Okay, now it's just a matter of doing some algebra, right? So here we're gonna get one plus four N, equals 100, and that's going to be 99 for n. Okay, so n is going to equal, let's just put that in our calculator, um, divided by 4. So it's going to be 24.75. Okay, so let's just see whether we've answered our question, because we know that you can't have a term 
like a term in between two whole numbers, right? So it either has to be 24 or 25. So let's just read what it says. If this pattern continues, what is the maximum number of pentagons, right? So it's talking about like whole pentagons that can be formed in a row if, if a total of 100 candles are available. So the max, right, would be 24. Okay, you shouldn't round it up to 25 in this case because you would actually then need additional candles. It's saying you only have 100 candles. How many of these pentagons can you make? Okay, so it's important to understand what is being asked because some students would then just round up to 25 and that actually um, shows that you haven't read or understood the question necessarily in the way they wanted you to. Okay, so that's that question. It's a uh, fairly standard introductory questions to sequences and series. Sorry, there's lots of bugs here, I think, because of the light. But that's that question. Let's now move on to some of the other questions, which are bound to get a bit trickier. Okay, so it says an arithmetic series. So now they've told us it's arithmetic, guys. It's important because if you skip that word, then you're just like, oh, look, this is what the term is, and then, or this is what it's about, but you don't actually know its defining features, right? It's like if someone said, you know, um, Margie is uh, an actuary and she does this and this and this and then you ignore the fact that she's an actuary and, and the question actually wants you to take into consideration that she's an actuary, then you kind of miss the plot, right? So in this case, it's important to know because this is a defining feature, right? Okay. So an arithmetic series has a first term of three. So we know that A equals three, right? Write down the information you are given as you read it, right? A last term of 47. So we know that, we don't really know how many terms there are, but we know that the last term is 47, right? So I don't really know how to write that yet. And the sum of all the terms is 300. So we kind of know that TN equals 47 and SN, I'm just gonna make it N because we don't know how many terms there are, equals 300, okay? That's kind of what we know, okay? So let's now try to figure out what we can do, okay? So what we do here is I, we need to use this because we want to work out n, right? And we want to, and we've got a couple of inputs here, all right? So you could be thinking, Margie, but we don't have D. But this is where they're testing your understanding, right? There's this other formula that we learned, right, when we do arithmetic series that looks like this. Equals A plus L. Now, you could be saying, I don't know that, right? So this is important when they give you questions like this because they haven't given you the common difference, but they have given you the last term. That's what that L means. So actually what we can do is we do have all the inputs here and we can now solve for N, right? So now you might be saying, okay, must I learn that? Yes, you must learn that. You can see here, it is not given on our formula sheet, right? Do you see that? It's not given anywhere. You have to learn it, right? And it's basically a different sort of, um, it's a different rendition of what we have here, right? So you might be saying, oh, you know, like I don't really know what that's about. But it's, it's, it's just basically a different view of this, okay? So I think what's important is if you're confused, like go over this question again, right? But this is not, I'm not like teaching you any sort of like trickery or anything like that. It's just an additional way of doing arithmetic series, right? And that's why they're testing it. Okay, so let's sub this in. We don't know what N is, okay? Um, but we do know what A is, and we do know what the last term is, okay? So now we have, uh, that's going to equal 50, 50 over 2. So we're going to have 25 N, 300, and I think that is, if I'm not mistaken, it's 12. But let me just check, 300 divided by 25. Okay, perfect. So that is that, okay. So let us now look at the next question. Actually, I actually just want to quickly, I don't know if you, you can fast forward if you really know how to prove this, but I actually just want to show you where this comes from. Because I, I was happy with my explanation, but I think, you know, to give deep understanding, I'd rather explain it. So if you know this, guys, pop to the, just fast forward a little bit, but I'm just going to quickly explain this. So we know that Sn equals N over 2, right, which equals 2A plus N minus 1D, okay? But this can be written like this, okay? It can be written as A plus A, plus N minus 1, D, right? But if you look at that, right, that's actually, 
right? Exactly the same as Tn. So we can write this as Sn equals n over 2 A plus Tn, right? Because that's exactly the same as that. I've just substituted it, made it a bit simple, simpler. We define this as Tn, and therefore you get that formula, okay? I just want you to, to not just believe things. I want you to actually understand what they mean, okay? Cool. So that's that little sidebar. I hope that makes sense. Literally, just to show you that it's just a different form of what we've seen already, All right? And now let us go over here to the next question. So interestingly now, they say determine the common difference. Well, now we know that we can just use Tn equals A plus N minus 1 D, okay? So we know that our last term, we're going to use our last term here, is 47. Our first term is 3 plus, we know that this term is 12, right? And then we're going to make that D, okay? So you might be thinking, okay, Marks, where does that all come from? Okay, just remember, I've written it all over here. I've said A equals 3. We've determined that the last term, there's 12 terms, and they told us that the 12th term equals 47. So we're just subbing in all the information we have. Okay, I'm going to bring the 3 this side, and it's going to be 44, and that's going to be 11D, so D is going to equal 4. So our constant difference is still 4, similar to what we had over here, right, with our previous one. But this here is also 4. Okay, so these are just interesting ways of, of testing arithmetic series, right? So don't be super phased by it, but you need to be thinking about how things can be represented differently, okay? It's very important to, to think about those different representations because often they ask things in a non-traditional representation because then you can really display your understanding, right? Because you can say, okay, I understand what you're asking and I, I can still identify something even if you give it to me in a slightly different form. And that shows really deep understanding. Okay, but now I will stop talking about that and move on to our next question. Okay, it says calculate. This is sigma notation, right? You could say, what's sigma? This little sign here, this little e is sigma of n equals 2 to infinity for 1 over 2 n plus 2. Okay, when you're seeing things with infinity, you should be thinking about this formula here. Okay, and you could be saying, oh, what, what about like an um, a arithmetic sequence, right? You could be thinking, well, how do I know what sort of sequence it is? Well, we see that there's a common ratio. You see that? Because every single term is multiplied by 1 over 2. Okay, right? So let me just show you the first couple of terms, right? So when n equals 2, it's going to be 4, 1 over 2 to the 4. And the next one is going to be 4, 1 over 2 to the 5. You see, so it increases each time by 1 over 2. Okay, so it's important to be able to identify a certain series by its defining traits that I spoke to earlier. Okay, so let's now look at this formula. Okay, so we know that we want to use this formula. We know that R has to be between 1 and negative 1. And in this case, we know that R is going to equal a half. If you don't believe me, you could always use the terms I've given you there. Right, you could say, you know, the second term over the first term, and that actually equals a half. Okay. So that's what R equals, right? So A is just going to equal, right? It's going to be this 4, 1 over 2 to the power of 4, which we can just put into our calculator. Let me just show you how I do that. Importantly, make sure you type it incorrectly because it's easy to get wrong. So that's 1 over 4, okay? So now all we need to do is we need to sub it into our calculation, okay? So... Let's pop it in. Okay, so we're going to have s to infinity, sum to infinity. We're going to say, um, what are we going to say? Where's a? 1 over 4 over 1 minus 1 over 2. Okay, so we know, right, that if our, our ratio, right, is between these two intervals, it's converging right? That was one of the things that we learned, right? When we looked at the ratio, right? We know it converges because effectively what happens, right? Is you're timesing it by fraction. So it means that each term is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as we head to infinity. So it's going to converge to a, towards a point, right? Okay. 
and that's what we are showing here. So let's just pop this into our calculator and let's see what it converges towards. One over four. You can write this in decimals if you feel more comfortable doing so. Right, and that equals a half, okay? So that is that, okay? So now you might be thinking, but Margie, it starts at n equals two, right? But in this case, what we've done is, what I've done is I've written out the terms, right? I've started writing out the terms and I've termed this one. I've termed this two. I've termed this three and it goes to infinity. So it actually is a sum to infinity. Don't get waylaid by things like that, okay? It's very important to write it out like this, make this the first term, make that the second term, and then work with the sum to infinity formula given that our ratio was within our restriction. Okay, so that's that. Let's now go on to, I think it's our last question for this, for this um, specific uh, sequences and series question. Let's now see what it says. It says, in a geometric sequence, again, they've told you, right? So you should be thinking constant ratio, okay? Constant R. The third term, right? So T3 equals 5P plus 1. The fifth term equals 4. The seventh term equals 1. Okay, let's just see if we've got everything there, right? So it says in a geometric, in a geometric sequence, the third term is 5p. Five, five Perfect. The fifth term is 4. The seventh term is 1. Okay, I've written it all down. Determine the value of p. Okay, so this is quite an interesting one, right? Because you could be thinking, good grief, like how on earth would I do this? But we know that we have a constant ratio, right? So we know that t4 over t3 equals the same as t5 over t4, right? Which equals the same as t um, T6 over T5, which equals the same as T7 over T6. But what we could do is we could just cancel those, right? And we could cancel those. And then effectively, we get T5 over T3 equals T7 over T5. Okay, so we've basically just given ourselves a way to solve this given what we have. Okay, and this, what this is demonstrating is that you understand the characteristics of a geometric sequence, right? And that is very, very important. Okay, now we just sub it in. So we say 5p, oh, plus 1. Sorry, that's the denominator. So it should be 4. Um, and that should be that way. Okay, so now all we have to do is we have to solve. So I'm going to bring that 4 up here, make that 16, and bring that up here. Okay. So it's going to be 15 equals 5p. So I have, oh, I've not shown you what I've done there. Okay. So I've basically just done some algebra, brought that up, found a common denominator and cancelled. Right. Um, and then we've said here that 16 equals 5p plus 1 solved and p equals 3. Okay. Importantly here, p cannot equal negative one over five, right? Because that would make the, the denominator um, zero, which would make this um, undefined and you can't have that, right? That's it's, it's mathematically, it, it just doesn't give us an answer, right? So that's the only thing it can't equal, but we now have given it a specific value and said it has to equal three, okay? So sometimes these questions can be a little bit tricky. As I've shown here, a lot of it is about understanding different traits. It's understanding different representations, but most of all, these questions are actually about practice. So I hope you, I hope you found this helpful. And we'll be moving on to the next question, which I think is also focused on sequences and series. Um, but anyways, see you just now. Bye.